Uh, what we have um, what we have seen in this lecture series until now is structural geology. The formation of rocks, um, mostly at the relatively small scale. And now we will go to the second part <coughs> of this lecture series, that is the tectonics. We will now switch scales and look at the formation at the scale of planets and the plate margins. The main difference is, first of all, that it's much bigger, the things that we are seeing in tectonics. But the other main difference, if you want to visualize it, is that at this scale, the objects are so big that gravity plays a much bigger role. We will see that whole mountain belts can flow apart under their own weight over geologic time. And in this first lecture, I will um, basically try to give you a, a feeling of uh, what a fantastic and what a powerful um, science uh, the science of tectonics is, how much we can understand of the Earth. And in this lecture, I will focus mainly on the different tools that we use, so that after that, I can build on the, your knowledge of these tools. Um, but before I start with that, uh, just a few words about tectonics or geodynamics, if you want. Um, geodynamics that started with plate tectonics in the 70s has given us the first really global paradigm. A paradigm, a set of ideas, scientific ideas, to really understand quantitatively how our planet functions. It is quantitative, we can calculate things, and also the models that geodynamics produces are testable. We can actually calculate what a certain thing should be and then compare it with our measurements. And in this field, there has been a huge evolution in the past 15 years. Nowadays, we are able to predict and to calculate and to model, but at the same time also to measure with more and more accuracy and more and more detail. For me, tectonics is one of the most exciting parts of geoscience. It is really quite exciting. It is high tech. There is a lot of very complicated and new measurement techniques which is available, uh, high performance computing, modeling, so it really is great fun. The tectonics that is modern is based on processes. We have to understand the processes which are there and then we can build these processes into models. Um, if you want to become proficient, if you want to understand uh, tectonics, you really have to understand complexity. There are many, many processes interacting with each other and if anything, um, at the end of this course, you will understand that many, many things interact in tectonics. For example, in the final lecture, I will explain to you that the exhumation, the coming up of metamorphic rocks in mountain belts, is really tremendously influenced by rain and rainfall and erosion. Very important. Interpretation and prediction are two key words, or two key elements. We really have to be able to interpret the data, to interpret the information, and then predict, so that the predictions can be tested. And there are many applications of tectonics where these predictions are, of course, very important. So, what are the resources? Well. Tectonics is probably one of the parts of geoscience which is the best illustrated and the best also uh, presented to the public. There are many, many beautifully illustrated books at all levels. You can uh, study tectonics as in, in high school or uh, with your family if you're, if you're interested over Christmas time. Um, and there are really quite a lot of online courses. If you go to our course website, we will give you lots of links 
of beautifully illustrated online courses which are of very, very high quality. For this course, we um, recommend the books by Cox and Hart and Morse and Twists. And of course, you can use the lecture notes uh, which are available here. Uh, in our library, uh, here in the Lochnerstrasse, we have uh, a huge collection of many, many tectonic books. So you can browse around and see what you like. Um, and then, of course, in the online library of the RWTH, uh, there is a very large collection of papers and publications all about <coughs> tectonics. You can look at old exam questions if you want, and, of course, talk to us. The ENDO team is always there to help you around. So, just a few really basic things that, that one has to understand about our planet. The first one is the distribution of surface elevations. So this graph is a histogram of how much of the world area is how high. This is sea level, and you can see that quite a lot of the area is really not very high, and then just a very small part of the planet is high mountains, and of course they go to about eight and a half kilometers in the Himalaya, and then again going down, there is a lot of planet, which is about, what, four kilometers deep, ocean, and then there is just a little bit which is a lot deeper. And this is, of course, a consequence of plate tectonics, and you have heard uh, this story before in the introduction. And plate tectonics um, is, as I already said, this major paradigm. Very simply said, What plate tectonics tells us is that on the surface of Earth we have plates, rigid or semi-rigid parts of the Earth's outer surface, which move around in a quite a complicated way, amalgamate into supercontinents, break apart, and of course always cover the Earth's surface. If that is the case, then at some Places, two plates must go apart, and the crack between these two plates is filled by magma, creating new crust, and in other places, these plates must go and disappear into the depth. And the third possibility is that the two plates have lateral motion, and these three possible Contacts between the plates are the three main major parts of plate boundaries. So what I will do in this lecture series is I will first talk about the global processes, about the structure of the Earth, about mantle convection, about plate motions, and then I will go one by one and look at the different kinds of plate boundaries. First I will look at the extensional plate boundaries, then at the strike slate boundaries, and at the end, the convergent boundaries. And you are now already of the generation who have grown up with plate tectonics. So I think for you it is a little bit more difficult to really imagine what an enormous revolution plate tectonics in the earth sciences was. When I was a student in 74, I started my studies, and then part of my professor still did not believe in plate tectonics. And uh, it was, I was studying, about your age, in a time when plate tectonics was really taking over geoscience, suddenly allowing many, many measurements and observations to be explained in a quantitative, predictable model. Um, and geoscience completely changed after we had plate tectonics. Um, it was a true scientific revolution in the sense of uh, Thomas Kuhn. I don't know if uh, maybe uh, one of you has read his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, telling you how science kind of 
develops slowly and then suddenly there are big revolutions which completely change the science and then it goes on to continue. So, one of the famous pictures that many, many people have seen and it has gone around the world is uh, this map showing you the age of the ocean crust. So very simply, if you go around the ocean and take samples from the ocean floor below the sediments of course and you make a map of how old the ocean crust is and color them the oldest is about 200 million years as the youngest is zero you can see this beautiful pattern very very clearly showing that there are these mid-oceanic ridges where two plates separate and as we are lecturing here, new crust is forming in the middle. And that nowhere on the planet there is oceanic crust, which is older than about 200 million years, because it has all been subducted. In fact, this statement is not completely true, because there is oceanic crust older than 200 million years, preserved in very small pieces in mountain belts, where the oceanic crust has been squeezed in the, the contact zone between um, continents and during the collision. These uh, oceanic crust rocks are called ophiolites, and of those we have older. But intact oceanic crust never gets older. Of course, the continents are much, much older. So there is really a huge difference there. And we have seen beautiful illustrations of how continents move over time. This is a very famous picture of how Africa has moved with a clockwise rotation and at the same time India has broken apart and moved to collide with Asia. Uh, there are many different ways to reconstruct the plate motions um, and really go back in time and uh, tell how the, the plate tectonic configuration of the Earth was over time. And this has been done by many workers. Uh, some of them put their results online. You probably have all visited this uh, website of uh, Chris uh, Scortese. Um, he used to be my colleague at Shell and then started a company selling his uh, ideas. Um, and this is just one of those examples in the late Cretaceous, uh, where you have that, where you can clearly see that the North Atlantic Ocean and the South Atlantic Ocean is much less wide than it is now. The continents are recognizable, but of course India has not yet collided with Asia. We don't have a Himalaya yet, and so forth. The reason why this plate tectonic plate tectonics can operate is several fold. But first of all, we have to understand why there are plates. So, let's look at some of these very, very simple uh, pictures of the outside of the Earth. Uh, and the most beautiful one, or the one that I like most, is from the book by Cox and Hart. Um, there is a very thick mantle of the Earth and the top part of the mantle is called the lithosphere and in this mantle, or on top of this mantle, we have the crust. The ocean has a very thin crust and the continents have a much thicker crust. They also have a quite different chemistry, of course, but Continental crust and oceanic crust are on top of the mantle. Now if we zoom out a little bit and look from a more distance, okay, then there is the mantle, which has a very important discontinuity at this level. And the top part of the mantle is called the lithosphere. So this white layer here, is mantle, but it is much stronger 